right, we're busy with a series on prayer, and I know you know this, but I'm going to say in any case, because sometimes it's good for us just to be reminded that prayer is powerful. Prayer is powerful. And that's why I want to spend a bit of time on this. And, and we're doing a series on this. I, I think it's one of the most important, one of the most powerful things that you and I can do. A life without prayer is a life without power. And so if I had to ask you this morning, and, and don't answer, just it take you a while to come up with the answer in any case. How much time do you think per day you spend in prayer? Do you know one survey showed that the average Christian spends seven minutes a day in prayer? So you say, is that a lot? Is that a little? <laughs> Compared to the rest of our day? Come on. And then they wonder why their prayers aren't being answered, why they're not experiencing breakthroughs. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, once said, God does nothing but in answer to prayer. And so prayer is not an option for us as believers. It's a necessity because God works and responds to our prayers. So if we don't pray, God can't work. I don't know why he's chosen to operate like that, but that's the way God has chosen to operate. He waits for us to pray, and then he works in response to our prayer. So if we don't pray, he can't work. He, 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 he's, he, he can't uh, get involved in our, uh, in our affairs. You see, God hasn't intended uh, uh, for our lives just to operate in, in the natural on, on this level because there's a supernatural element available to you and me as well. And so prayer is the access point into heaven, accessing supernatural power into our lives. And so the moment you and I start praying, we don't even realize it, but we, we slowly busy accessing some supernatural into the natural. Now for many people, they don't even really realize this, and they'll shoot up a quick casual prayer and then they wonder things aren't changing in the natural is because they're not, they're not using this channel that God has given them. And it's interesting when you look at Jesus' life, how much he used that channel. When we look at his life, there are a lot of things that stand out. His kindness, his caring, his compassion to people. His teaching ministry, a lot of teaching, his healing ministry. But if there's one thing that really stands out in Jesus' life, it's prayer. Jesus spent a lot of time in prayer. Now, I look at that and I think if that was important for Jesus, then surely it must be important for you. Surely it must be more important for you and me to spend time in prayer. And I'm sure Jesus' disciples were saying the same thing, wondering the same thing. If he prays so much, then surely, surely we must, because they'd notice something. Number one, he spends a lot of time in prayer. And when he does, heaven moves. Some things happen. And so they came to Jesus one day and they said, Rabbi, teach us how to pray. Show us how, because we've been watching you. You spend time in prayer. And so just, just help us out here. <laughs> And that's, of course, where Jesus gave us and them the Lord's Prayer. He didn't only give it to them, it was for us as well. Now, we can look at it quickly. What's interesting with the Lord's Prayer is that Jesus doesn't give us a formula. He doesn't say, I want you to pray this prayer exactly like this every single day. You see, the point is not to memorize this and to rehearse it every single day in, in, in some kind of a, a rhyme. The point is to pray this way. He gives us a way to pray. And you'll see now in a couple of moments is that, that he actually, what he does here, he gives us six critical elements to pray. I call it the six P's. I'll give it to you in a couple of moments time. So he gives us six P's, six critical elements. And he says, he says, if you follow the order, because the order is quite important, you'll see in a couple of moments. He says, if you follow that, prayer actually becomes quite meaningful and powerful. So let's turn to the prayer quickly, and then I'll give you the six Ps. All right. So I'm reading from Luke chapter 11. It's also, of course, recorded for us in Matthew chapter 6. 
But, but Luke says this. He says, once Jesus was in a certain place praying. So there he's doing it again. Spent quite a bit of time praying. And as he finished, one of his disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. And so he, Jesus said to them, when you pray, say. Now, this is where he gives us the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we also forgive those who sin against us. And do not lead us in, tempta in temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And then Luke stops there, but Matthew takes it a step further. He gives us one more line. And Matthew says, For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right. Now, here are the six P's or the six critical elements that Jesus gives us. It starts with praise. And notice there, it ends with praise. And in between, there are four different P's. His purpose, His provision, His pardon, and His protection. And so Jesus is basically, you're going to see now, Jesus is telling us, He says, I, I want you to consider this, and, and I want you to, to pray in this order. And when you do, you'll find prayer becomes meaningful, and prayer becomes powerful. And I want you to do it daily. Because when you do it daily, it shows God that, that you're dependent upon Him. Remember what we said, when we're when we proud, when we're arrogant, then it's like, ah, you know, I, I, don't, I, I don't need Him. But when there's a humility in our hearts, it's like, God, I desperately need you part of my life. All right. So let's quickly go to the first one and let's have a look at praise. Why does Jesus tell us to start with praise. He says, I want you to start with, with, with praise because I don't want you to start with yourself. I don't want you to start with your needs and wants and, 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 and desires. I, I don't want you to come in with your, with your, your, your shopping list, as, as it were. I want you to just, just wait for a while. And, and I want you to come and focus on God and just recognize, just realize who it is you are busy praying to, who it is you're talking to. He says, because when you realize that, something happens to your faith. And, and let's be honest, when we come to God in prayer, we want to come in faith. So often when we come to Him in prayer, we come saying, give me, give me, give me, isn't it? Instead of saying, thank you, thank you, thank you. Bless you, bless you, bless you. God, I praise you. God, you're wonderful. God, thank you so much for, for what you've done. Because you see, there's power in praise. On Wednesday evening, I shared the scripture with you in, in Psalm 100. Let's look at it on the screen. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. I, th I, think, I think the psalmist there understood something about the power of praise it's the key that unlocks heaven. And so when, when we come to him, even the psalmist says, come to him in praise. Come to him with thanksgiving. It, it gets you through the gates. It unlocks the door into, into the, 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 the inner room. Now maybe you're wondering, how much time do I need to spend on praise? Listen, listen. The amount of time is not the issue here. The issue is just realizing who it is you're busy talking to. You, you, you are not talking to some distant God out there. You know, the man upstairs. You're talking to the creator of the universe, our Father, our Heavenly Father. And, and, and if, you, if you get there within the first 30 seconds and you realize, God, you're awesome and God, you've done so much, and you're my heavenly father, you're my daddy. If you, if you get there in a couple of seconds, you, 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 you're ready to move on. So it, it's, not, it's not how much time, it's realizing who it is that you're busy talking to. Now, maybe you're saying, but surely God doesn't need my praise. He doesn't need, you know, his ego to be built up. It's not about building up his ego. 
It's about building up our faith. That's what happens when we spend time in, in praise. The more time you and I praise God, the less time we've got to spend on our problems. The bigger you make God, somehow the smaller your problems become. But sometimes we do it the opposite way around. We, we don't make God big. We, we don't go there first. We go to our problem first. Oh, God, this problem. God, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know how I'm going to handle this thing. God, this is such a headache. This is such a nightmare. And so what are we doing? We, we're focusing on the problem. The problem becomes big. Instead of saying, God, you're awesome. God, you're so big. <laughs> and guess what? This becomes so small, and you realize, oh, Lord, you know, one, one click of your fingers, and you can sort that thing out just, just like that. And so what happens when we spend time in praise? Praise changes our perspective. It changes our perspective. It's still the same problem, but in the light of Him, that problem is not that big anymore. It changes the perspective. David says in, in Psalm 34, he says, magnify the Lord with me. Now, think about this for a moment. When you magnify an, an, an object, either with a, a magnifying glass or, or a microscope or something like that, do, are you changing the actual size of the object? No, but you're changing your perspective of that object. And so what David is saying, he says, don't magnify your problems. He says, magnify your God. And so one of the best things that you and I can do when we go through problems and difficulties is just to magnify God and just to come and say, God, you created the entire universe. You flung the stars into, into space and you simply spoke the earth into existence. God, you, you're just amazing. God, you can do the impossible. What are you doing? Are you making him any bigger than what he is? Not really. You can't. But you're making him bigger in your own mind. You are magnifying God. And so whenever you and I go through a difficult time, when there are challenges in our lives, and we all go through those times, just be aware that the enemy wants to mess up your perspective. How does he do that? By, by getting you to focus on the size of the problem. So in other words, to focus, to, to, to magnify the problem. Because the moment you and I start magnifying the problem, oh, look at how big the problem is. The enemy has just successfully messed up our perspective. And so that's where you and I have got to come and just remind ourselves, our God can turn water into wine. He can split oceans if he wants. He can turn dry bones into an army. He can cause the impossible to be possible. That's the God that we serve. And so when you start reminding yourself of those things, guess what happens? Your perspective changes. And suddenly God is much bigger than the problem. And that's why David says, magnify the Lord with me. Don't magnify your problem. We all got problems. He says, magnify the Lord. Can you see how important it is just to start off, just to spend a couple of moments in, in, in praise and not to rush in with your shopping list? Lord, check what I have for you today. <laughs> Don't do that, all right? Let's move then to the next one quickly, and that's his purpose. So he says, start off with praise and then move to purpose. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Why is it so important to ask His purpose or His will? Because His will is so much better than ours. And so what we are doing, we're saying, God, I'm starting with praise. You're a good God. You're an awesome God. You've been faithful in my past. When, when I think back, God, you've been so faithful. I know you'll be faithful in, 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 in my future. And, and, and therefore, I want your will above mine. I, I'm, I'm submitting. I'm surrendering my will to, to your will. Can, can you see what, what, what we're doing? Maybe you're saying, whoa, Leonard, 
I think we've just taken a little bit too far. Can't we just pray the first part? Just pray our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Let's leave your kingdom come, your will. Let's just leave that part out. And do that if you want. But I think you'll be missing a crucial element. A crucial, crucial element. So, so let, me, let me try and illustrate it like this. When, when my son Stephen was just a little guy, just, just a youngster, sort of preschool, whenever he had some birthday money, we'd have to go to the toy store during the week and he'd have to go and select something. And, and, and he never came out with one item. They never do, do they? And so it's always two or three. Daddy, what do you think? But he always asked that. It was just absolutely amazing. And I'd say to Liesl, just look at this. He would always come and ask, Daddy, what do you think? Daddy, which one would you take? Why? Because somehow at that little age, that little guy knew that his daddy knew a little bit better than him. And his daddy also had his best interest at heart. Listen, let me say to you, when you click that your heavenly father knows a little bit better. And he has your best interest at heart in any case. <laughs> it's no problem to pray his will. It's easy to come and to say, Lord, your will be done. You see, the whole point of prayer, and please, you've got to hear this. The whole point of prayer is not to get your will. It's to align your will with his will. Because His will is so much better than ours. He knows so much better. He sees so much further. And so the moment you and I come and we say, God, your will be done. I've just given Him permission to do the best of my life. But if I insist on my will, God's not a bully. He'll give you your will if you want. <laughs> but it's not going to be the best long term. So, so l let me give you an example from my own life. Back in, in the year 2000, my father asked me if I would consider coming on to staff to, to help with the 20s congregation. And so I looked at him and I'm like, no, I don't think so. And so I was involved in business and really enjoying, had my own business, really enjoyed that. And God was really blessing us. We were doing well. Uh, I wasn't negative about the church at all. I was involved in the church. I was leading praise and worship, and, and, and we, we had some small groups, Liesl and myself. And, and so I was very involved in the church and very excited about the church, but not full-time. Not full-time. Not for me, thank you. And so, so I, I, I didn't want to do that. But here's the thing, and I was in my 20s then, late 20s. I'd already made up my mind at an early age, I want God's will for my life. That was a done deal. Because, because if, as long as I follow God and follow His will, I'd seen blessing upon blessing in my life already. And so that was it. I'd made up my mind. And so I said to my dad, look, I don't think this is a good idea. But I, I'll pray about it. And he said, that's fine. And I said, uh, but you know, when do you need an answer? He says, no, I'll take your time. Take your time. Go and pray about it. And so Liesl and I prayed about it. And we went away and we prayed together. And there's power in, in agreement when we come together with our spouse. And we prayed together like that. Uh, um, and then well, there were times where we prayed separately. You can imagine, you know, you, you really got to pray about a thing like that. And so I, I'm not sure exactly what she prayed in those times, but I can tell you more or less almost exactly what I prayed. I said, Lord, if this is your will, I'll do it. You know my heart. I'll do it. But I hope it's not your will. <laughs> I promise you, I promise you, that's exactly what I prayed. <laughs> I think today you figured out what his will is, eh? <laughs> and so, I, I, you know, I ended up finding myself here. And I must be honest with you, the first couple of months was like, oh, Lord, really, this is crazy, you know? I, I think maybe even the first couple of years, it was like, oh, man. But I put my heart into it. I put my heart into it. When I look back today, I am so glad I made this decision because God knew some stuff that I didn't know back then. I thought business was the better option for me, but I know that I know that I know that I'm in God's will today and this is where he wants me. And so had I made the decision back then and, and like, God, this is, this is my will and I'd prefer this and can we just go with this plan? God's not mean. I'm telling you, God would say, go ahead. 
But I would never have been as fulfilled as where I am today. And so if there's something that I've settled in my heart from my 20s already is to pray His will. And, and let me just say to you, it doesn't mean that you can't have a preference, that you've got to come and pretend, well, Lord, you know, listen, God doesn't mind us having a preference. Not at all. You can come and say, Lord, you know, I don't really want to do that. And I, I don't think I'll, I'll do well at that. And, but, but your will and not mine. Isn't that exactly what Jesus prayed? Because Jesus had a preference, by the way, that was very different to what God had. God said, I, I think you need to go to that cross. You see the tree over there? And he's like, not that one. Can we go in this direction, rather? Let me read it to you. Think I'm making it up. Father, if you are willing, if you are willing, he says, take this cup away from me. So in other words, I don't want to do it. I prefer us not going down that road. Yet, not my will, but yours be done. You see that? You see his preference. But you see a heart of submission as well. Yet, not my will, yours be done. So all I'm saying is, you can be honest with yourself, and you can be honest with God, but if you're smart, <laughs> you'll submit to His will. Let me just say to you, sometimes, sometimes our prayers and His answers, we're praying for something, and He gives an answer. Those are very, very different. They don't look alike at all. And sometimes God gives us something that we never asked for, and it's like, God, how does that work? And so I found, I found in my life, I may not be happy with the answer, but I know I'm going to be happy with the outcome. So in other words, I may not be happy short term, but I will be happy long term. And so when, when God started speaking to us, and I don't have time to go into that, because we prayed and we said, Lord, we'll do it. If this is your will, we'll, we'll get rid of the business. We'll sell that. And we'll come into ministry. And, 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 and uh, when God started speaking to us, and God showed us again and again and again, very, very, very clearly, God showed me to, to do that. When, when, when I got the answer, it was like, ah, flip, I don't want to do this. <laughs> because I'd grown up in a home where my parents were poor. <laughs> they battled the rest, of, you know, all their lives. We grew up like that. And I thought, man, I'm not going to live like that. You know, they're doing an awesome job. They're doing a great job, but that's not for me. I want to make money, you know. And, and I'm telling you, when I look at it today, I wouldn't choose anything else. I wouldn't choose anything different. Could I have made maybe a little bit more money there? I think so. But that's not the issue for me anymore. I, I'm, not, I'm not excited about that anymore. I'm excited about God's kingdom and about, about your lives being changed. That's the stuff that, that really excites me. And so I think we've just got to remind ourselves that God knows what the future holds. I don't. And God knows better. <laughs> I don't. God has plans for my life, great plans for my life, the Bible says. I don't even know what those plans are. And that's why the Bible says here in Isaiah 55, my thoughts are not your thoughts. It's like almost God just, let me let you in on a secret, just come closer. My thoughts are not your thoughts, <laughs> nor your ways my ways. So he says, you know, I know you're praying for this, but you, your ways are not my ways. It's going to look a little bit different. And sometimes we're so looking for the answer that we've made up our minds. You know, God needs to answer the prayer this way. And so when the answer comes a different way, in a different packaging, in a different color, we don't even see it because we, it's got to be this way. God, I need, I need a partner. I need a wife. God, that hot blonde. And I'm so looking for the hot blonde that I miss the gorgeous brunette sitting right behind me in church. Don't look behind you, by the way. <laughs> Come on, isn't that true? Sometimes we've made up our mind it's got to be this way. And then God does it another way, and, and, and then, then we lost. And so if we're going to pray God's way, God's will, sorry, we're going to make allowance for the answer to look a little bit different to what we have in mind. And, and I've just found in my own life, the answer's almost always different <laughs> to what I had in mind. And so when God answers, it, it's a very different answer. And so I'll share with you now in a moment when, when you pray, how, how 
you know, it's maybe a good idea to pray this way. Before we get there, let me quickly give you an example here from Scripture. Remember when the children of Israel, when uh, they didn't have bread and, and, and meat in the wilderness, and they were used to bread and meat in Egypt, and so they find themselves in the wilderness, they find themselves in a, in a, in a, in a, a season of their lives, a chapter of their lives that's slightly different to the previous chapter, and, 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 and they did exactly what we did. You know the good old days. Oh, the good old days weren't so good. You were slaves there, you stupid fools. You know, but in any case, it was the good old days. And we do the same at times. And so God says to Moses, he says to them, I've heard the Israelites' complaints. Now tell them, in the evening you will have meat to eat. He's almost saying to them, just relax. I'm going to send you meat. And in the morning you will have all the bread you want. Then you will know that I'm the Lord your God. That evening, vast numbers of quail flew in and covered the camp. And the next morning, the area around the camp was wet with dew. And when the dew evaporated, a flaky substance, cornflakes, eh? Uh, as fine as frost, blanketed the ground. And the Israelites were puzzled when they saw it. What is it? They asked one another. What is this? It didn't come packaged the way we thought. God said he's going to send us bread. This doesn't look like Albany. What, what is this? <laughs> you see, they had something. I wonder how many times we do that. We've already made up our mind how God is going to send it. Take a lot, we'll drop it at the door, and so-and-so is going to pay for it because they have a lot of money. And then it comes a completely different way. And, and, it's the, and we don't even see it. But God answers our prayer in a very different way than we, what we had in mind. I think sometimes we limit God because we try and prescribe how He should and shouldn't do something. And, and we're, busy, we're busy limiting Him. And so this is what I've been doing. When there's, when there's a, a, a need or a challenge or something, bring it to God. No problem. God, God invites us to do that. But don't tell Him how to answer it. So no, or, or in other words, don't figure in your own mind. Because I don't know if you ever do this, but, but I do. I do. You know, God could use so-and-so, and God could do it this way. And if this falls in place, and that domino. And, and I've already got the whole thing worked out. And I've got a couple of options for God. You know, God, I can help you out here. Don't do that. Don't do that. Because he's not going to use it in any case. <laughs> and you're just frustrating yourself. So you know what I've learned? Lord, here's my problem. I'm looking forward to see how you're going to answer that. That's it. Come on. Because, because we limit God through, through you know, uh, the, trying to prescribe to a, to a mighty God. He's a miracle-working God. Come on. And so let's just make room for him. Do it your way, Lord. Your will be done. Because when he does it, you and I are going to stand amazed. It's like, wow. <laughs> and it becomes the testimony that we talk about. The goodness and the faithfulness and the power of our God. If I had to ask you this morning, do you believe God's all-powerful? You don't have to answer. Just... Just think about it, just for yourself. Do you believe God can do miracles today? Do you really believe God has your best interest at heart? Come on, man. I think for, I think for most of us, yeah, it's like absolutely, it's no problem. Here's the test. If we say we do, we'll have no problem to pray. You will be done. And take a step back and say, Lord... <laughs> I'm at peace, I'm at rest. You do it when you want to, how you want to. Come on. If we say we believe those things, we'll be at peace. So, Jesus' disciples come to him and say, Rabbi, teach us to pray, because, because clearly this prayer thing is powerful, it works. So what does he do? He gives us these six things. He says, I want you to start with praise 
He says, just spend a couple of moments on praise. Just, just focus on who it is you're talking to. It's not some distant God out there, but it's a God who loves you very, very much. As a matter of fact, He's, he's your heavenly Father. So in other words, He wants the best for you. Spend a bit of time doing that. Magnify Him. Don't magnify the problem. And then when your faith is built up, then move quickly to the next one and go His purpose. And just say, Lord, I've got quite a bit of stuff that I, that I need to bring to you. I've got some stuff on my heart, but I want you to know I want your will to be done. It's the smartest thing you can pray because you're not asking for your will. You, 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 you don't want your will to be answered. You, you're aligning your will with His will. And that's probably one of the best things. The moment you and I do that, we give Him permission. We say, Lord, you've got a thousand ways to answer this, to solve this problem. Your will be done. Uh, I, I, I want nothing else. And then, then, once you've done that, and, and let me tell you, it can take you just a couple of, a couple of moments to go through those first two. Then get your shopping list out and pull it and say, Lord, now I've got this for you. God is not threatened by our needs and our wants and our desires. I'm telling you, He's, he's our heavenly Father. And that's when we bring our, our, our uh, uh, needs to Him because He is our provider. And He tells us to do that. So how do we do that? Well, you don't have time for that today. I'll share it with you next week, all right? All right. Come, let's stand. How many of you had to hear the praise part today? That was, that was the part you had to hear today. Okay. How many of you was to pray your will be done? Oh, that's a tough one. But I needed that one. All right. Lord, thank you for speaking into our hearts today. Thank you that we know you are our loving Heavenly Father. And you are there for us and you invite us to come to you and, and to pray and so, Lord, help us this week now as we come to spend just a couple of moments and just to realize how awesome you are. And help us every time we pray to pray, your will be done. Because, God, we know your will is always, always best for us. Amen. Bless you. Have a good week.